from heaven old clouds her bright glory Jesus the son of God will come for his jewels so precious and holy Jesus the Son of God Oh sweet wonder Oh sweet wonder Jesus the Son of God Oh how I adore him Oh how I love him Jesus the son of God Well we're out here on this cold, uh, wintry uh, February night. What is it? The second of February, February number two. And want to say I thank Brother Adam for coming and picking myself and Brother Kate from Brother Tory up. These roads are pretty hazardous out here, but uh, got us here where we're able to do a little Bible study with you. I uh, want to go to God in prayer for all of those that are in need. I remember Brother and Sister Smith, they had to take Sister Veda to the hospital uh, that the Lord would touch her body, Sister Samuel, Sister Blevins, Sister Segris, that all of our standing requests, uh, all the saints of God all over. And I uh, hope you're staying inside and staying warm and uh, being protected in all this weather. Let's go before the Lord in prayer. Dear God, in Jesus' name, thank you for your kindness and your goodness. Thank you for an opportunity. You gave us a promise where two or three are gathered together in your name that you would be in their midst. And Lord, as we begin to sing that song, oh, we felt your spirit even walk into this house. Thank you, Lord, for that promise that you said that you would be there. I ask you, Lord, to touch Brother and Sister Smith and Sister Veda, Sister Blevins, Sister Samuel, Sister Segrist, all the saints that have needs, one by one and name by name. Meet every need, I pray. Pray that, they are, that they'll be staying warm and well and safe in this uh, incremental weather that we're having. We'll give your name the praise for it. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, now hopefully by... Sunday, this will be cleared out enough. That's what they're saying. We'll be able to have church, and we're going to be having revival Sunday, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Monday night. Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Monday night, Brother Clark Copeland will be here preaching for us, and we're so excited. Man, I tell you what, we had such an outpouring last Sunday. Brother uh, Greg Bryant was with us, and preach an outstanding message on that Sunday morning on the foundations. And Sunday night, I'm telling you, the Holy Ghost just walked in this house. And I guess for an hour, the Lord just poured out his spirit. There were folks that was, uh, the choir began to sing about the glory of God and the wonder of God and the majesty of God. And the Holy Ghost began to fall, and I mean to tell you, it was just a tremendous outpouring of His Spirit. And I can still feel some of the residue in this house even this evening. Well, I, 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 uh, I don't know what to call this this, this afternoon or this evening. Uh, I, I'm going to read you a scripture found in the 8th chapter of the book of Romans, Romans chapter 8 and verse number 20 for the creature was made subject 
to vanity. Not willingly, but by reason of him who hath subjected the same in hope. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by the reason of him who hath subjected the same in hope. I'm going to call this little Bible study that I'm doing tonight meandering. Well, that's what I'm going to be doing. I'm just going to be wandering around, meandering. And uh, I went to bed last night, and uh, these thoughts got a hold of me. In fact, I, I was up to way late in the morning, uh, this meandering. That's what I was doing. I just meandering. So that's what I'm going to do to you, even our... our uh, our church family that's going to be listening to this tonight, to hear the ramblings of an old preacher meandering. But in this meandering, we're going to be talking about really something that's more than just a little surface. So if you're a hallelujah, glory to God, thank you, Jesus, ha, ta, 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 kind of guy, then you're probably not going to get much out of this uh, Bible class tonight, because this is a Bible class about the Bible. So many Bible classes are about everything but the Bible. As a matter of fact, some folks call preaching. It's really, it's really, their teaching is really preaching in slow gear. It's really not any teaching at all. But the Word of God is, they are, it is like olives, olives. Verses are like olives. And the only way you can get oil out of the olive, you have to squeeze the olive to get the oil. And that's really what we're going to do tonight. This is a challenging verse. There are two main thoughts in the religious world that are really primary doctrines. I think both of them are in error. And I want to talk about them tonight and give you what I really feel like the Bible would have us to know about God. Oh, I, I like talking about God. Some folks get thrilled talking about anything but God, but I like to talk about the greatness of God, the, the, the wisdom of God, the glory of God, the, you know, the power of God, God's wonderful mind. Job talked about how such little portion we know of him. You know, God is so vast and so big that our little finite mind has a hard time grasping God. And uh, because of that, folks come up with uh, uh, man-made philosophies that really become dangerous in trying to comprehend God when they don't really comprehend the nature of God. Anything that is against the nature, anything, any doctrine that you teach against the nature of God is automatically, you can, you can say that's an error. It's like the doctrine of the Trinity. We're not going to talk about the Godhead, but uh, God, is, God is not a plurality of beings. You know, that, 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 that divides God. That, that makes God uh, a freak. Anything that has more than one head is a freak. That's why some homes are in trouble. They got two heads in the home. Well, some churches are in trouble. Got a board and they got a pastor, sister pastor. And let me slap this while I'm at it. All you guys that's appointed yourself as bishops, appointed your husband or, or your son or somebody down the road as a pastor, and you're still running the ship, then uh, anything that's got two heads is a freak. You got a freakish church. Well, praise God. Amen. If you, if you want to be the pastor, you need to stay being the pastor. Instead of putting that guy out there, some kind of figurehead that's on some salary, and you're going to call all the shots. If you're the boss, you need to say you're the boss. Well, you, I didn't, hey, praise God, glory to God. A lot of folks listen to this, and if you're listening to this and you're one of them self-appointed bishops, I am a bishop. Every pastor is a bishop. 
you don't appoint another bishop in a place. I am a bishop. Every pastor is a bishop. The bishop is not an honorary title where you call somebody a bishop and you put somebody else in as a pastor. The pastor is the bishop. Well, enough of that. Praise God. Glory to God. I probably stirred up enough. We've got a lot of folks listening to these live streams. And uh, uh, so that, that'll give folks enough to talk about across the country for the rest of the week, praise the Lord. But it's the Bible. What you're doing is not the Bible. We're going to stay with the Bible, praise the Lord. Anyhow, there are two main views in religion, and uh, they're opposites. They're opposites. They're, they're so far apart. And to me, they're both so wrong. One of them is the doctrine of Calvinism where Calvinists believe that God is sovereign, which that is so. God can do what he wants to do, when he wants to do, anytime he wants to do it, just simply because he is God. But uh, uh, they believe God, by being sovereign, in eternity past, just looked down through time and said, uh, uh, Adam will go to heaven and Tori will go to hell. So that's, so that. Regardless what they, uh, that's the bottom line. Uh, I've chosen Adam to go to heaven. I've chosen Tor to go to hell. Adam couldn't go to hell if he wanted to. He's got to go to heaven. Got to go to heaven. There's nothing he can do. He's got to go to heaven. And Tory, no matter how much he wants to do right, he's got to go to hell. He's got to go to hell because God chose him to go to hell. Number one, that makes God a monster. You make God a monster. If you have God making people wicked, then sending them to hell because they're wicked, then what kind of God do you have? You know, we put people in jail for child abuse, for abusing their children, bringing them in the world, then beating the living daylights up, burning them with fires, and putting them out in the cold. Some folks think God is like that, that God made a creation. And then he's going to uh, uh, beat the living daylights out of them then finally send them to an eternal hell uh, because he's just God and he can do that because he's God. Well, number one, that is against the, that's against anything you read about God in the Bible. God is not a monster. In fact, that's why Jonah didn't want to go to Nineveh because God, uh, he knew how God was. And Jonah did not have a message of repentance. Jonah just went down there and said what God said. Yea, and in three days, God's going to overthrow this place and God's going to destroy this place and it's going to be done. Or whatever, how many days, it slips my mind right now. But you know what? The king heard it. The citizens heard it. And everybody got out in sackcloth and ashes and repented. And God said, you know, I'm, I'm going to spare Nineveh. Made Jonah mad. And if you'll read Jonah's record, Jonah told God, God, I knew you was going to do that because you're slow to anger and you're full of mercy and you're ready to forgive. Now, that's God. <laughs> that's not a God that predestines people to hell. So in, in the doctrine of Calvinism, uh, they think, I was predestinated to wear this blue coat tonight. I had to put on these clodhopper shoes, and I had no choice. I was acting out the sovereignty of God in everything that I do. We had ham and beans today, and they think that God made me make them ham and beans, and I had no choice. I couldn't, I couldn't have made a hamburger if I wanted to. I had to make ham and beans. That is, that is the... That is that end, that they believe, they believe that uh, the doctrine of predestination takes choice away from man. Then there's a doctrine of what they call open theism. Open theism. And open theism is another uh, philosophy that is in as much error as Calvinism is. Now, what's, here's what open theism is. That God in eternity past chose to be dumb. True. God chose not to know. He don't know if you're going to go to heaven. He don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. 
He don't know what's going to happen in the world. He don't know. He, he just waiting for everything to work out and hopes somebody goes to heaven. Matter of fact, he may have built that city 1,500 miles wide and high and nobody show up because he don't know. Well, that's the doctrine of open theism. And I've got, I've got friends, honestly, that believe both of that. I've got some that believe that God don't know, he chose not to know. And then I've got friends that believe that God did ordain and said, you, this has got to happen. And a lot of people are convenient Calvinists. Now, let me tell you what a convenient Calvinist is. A convenient Calvinist believes, if you ever hear folks say this, everything happens for a reason. Everything happens for a reason. Just like Brother Adam here. He didn't put any gas in his, in his truck. He heads out here to pick us up. And on the way here, he runs out of gas. And we're all in the cold, and we stand around in that car freezing to death, and somebody speaks up and says, well, everything happened for a reason. Well, it did. The reason was Adam was too stupid to pull over and get some gas. A lot of the trouble you're having out there, it ain't because... Well, this happened to me because everything happened for a reason. No, you signed a note you couldn't pay. You didn't have the ability to pay it when you signed the note. And, it, and well, they come took my truck away. Everything happened for, it, they, they took your truck away because you didn't make the payment. That was a reason. Well, praise the Lord. So somewhere in the mix of all of this meandering that I'm doing, this scripture jumped out at me. For the creature was made subject to vanity. Not willingly. Not willingly. But by the reason of him who subjected the same in hope. So here, here is how this really is. When God made Adam and Eve, when he made them, God gave them what is called a free will. For Adam and Eve was going to, he is made in the image of God. He made, him, he made him perfect. He made his wife perfect. He put him in a perfect garden. Everything about that setting was perfect. And even his free will was perfect. Adam could have chosen, Eve could have chosen not to have eaten of the fruit of the garden. They could have chosen to do that. However, this scripture here said the creature was made subject to vanity. God gave them a will not making Adam to fall, not making Eve to fall, but he gave them a will knowing the choices they was going to make. Now, that's not the doctrine of Calvinism. The doctrine of Calvinism is God made the choices for them. But the Bible doctrine here, and it's not the doctrine of open theism that God didn't have any idea what they were going to do. Listen to the passage. Because the creature itself also shall be delivered. No, i am got the wrong verse. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly. They didn't make themselves. It wasn't them that made themselves. It wasn't their design or their plan or their thought. But by the reason of him, God, God looking through the telescope of time, God said, you know, I've got a plan. I've got a plan that I'm going to work out. This is going to be my plan. I'm going to give man a will the man is going to be able to choose right and he's going to be able to choose wrong. But I'm not just going to leave it up to him totally. If I leave it up to him totally, then anything could happen. You're back into open theism. But I'm going to give him a choice, but in that plan, I am going to make a remedy. I am going to make a way of escape. I'm going to make a remedy that, that if and when man does fail, there's going to be a way out of his failure. Listen to, listen to the verse. 
This is the verse. By the reason of him who hath subjected the same in hope. I'm glad God has hope. I'm glad it's just not man that has hope, but God has hope. Praise God. God has a plan. You know the Bible says, let, 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 let me give you, let me, let, me, let me read you some scripture here. Here in the beautiful book of Psalms. I think it's 147. This beautiful book of Psalms here. Talking about the, 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 uh, the omniscience of God. Psalms 147 and verse 5. It says, great is our Lord and, and of a great power. And his understanding is infinite. That means God has an unlimited. There's nothing God don't know. Nothing. Nothing God don't know. There's nothing God does not know. God knows the, well, let me, let me, let me read you this here in Isaiah 46. Isaiah 46 in this beautiful verse in Isaiah 46, and I believe it's verse 10 if I'm not mistaken. It is verse 10. Declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times the things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand and I will do my pleasure. God is saying there's nothing that God does not know. There, there's never been, listen to me, there's never been an emergency meeting called in heaven. Never, never. God never. God's never wrung his hands and said, man, what am I going to do about this? Not because God made you do it. Not because God forced you to do it. Not because God decreed you to do it. But God, God's got that safety net. Well, praise God. God's got that safety net where God is able to catch us when we fall. He don't make us to fall. But he knows when we do fall that he is going to be there to help us and to deliver us from our failings and from our failures. Can you say praise the Lord? Let me read that again. Declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times the things that are not yet done, saying my counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. Let's look here in the, in the 15th chapter of the book of, of Acts. 15th chapter of the book of Acts. Another, another wonderful passage that talks about the, the wonderful attributes of God. 15 and 18. Known unto God. Known unto God known unto God are all of his works from the beginning of the world. There's nothing that's going to catch God by surprise. Now, here's why God can do that. Let me, let me read you this in the, in the book of Revelation. It's talking about Jesus and, 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 and his character and his being. And, and in, in the uh, Revelations 1 and 8, he said, I am Alpha, I am Omega, saith the Lord, which, wa, which is, which was, and is to come, the Almighty. Then he says it again here in verse 11. I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. Verse 17, fear not. I am the first and the last. So here you have God, here you have God, who is the first and the last. Nothing is going to catch him by surprise. Now, that's a great theological term that God is an omniscient God. That means God knows everything. Another theological term is omnipotent. God is omnipotent God. Jesus said, all power, Matthew 28, 18, is given to me in heaven and in earth. He has all power. He's an omnipotent God. There's nothing, there's nothing that God cannot do. You name it, God can do it. There's no mountain he can't move. There's no problem he can't solve. 
There's no disease that he cannot heal. Nothing is going to come up that God cannot take care of. So he's an omnipotent God. Then God is also an omnipresent God. I mean, there's nowhere that you can go that God is not in. He said, do not I feel the heaven and the earth. God is a God that fills the heavens of heavens. There's nowhere you can go that God's not at. Now, those are theological terms. Uh, omniscient, uh, omnipotent, omnipresent. But listen to me. Not only is that God's nature, and that's who God is, it works for you. That means God knows where you're at right now. He knows the trial you're in. He knows the struggle you're in. He knows the battle you're facing. He knows the dilemma that's upon you. He knows the circumstances that surround you. In fact, he knew it before you got there, before you got in this trial, before you got in this struggle, before you got in this battle, before you got in this situation. God knew you was going to be there. Because he's all-knowing God. So he's all-knowing. He's omniscient. Then God is omnipotent. Not only does he know your trouble, not only does he know your struggle, not only does he know your battle, not only does he know your situation, he's able to do something about it. I, I'm going to tell you, Jesus said in John 14 and 6, I am the way. He's the way out of your trouble. He's the way out of your situation. He's the way out of your, your dilemma. You're saying, what am I going to do? Where am I going to go? Jesus is saying, I am the way. Now, you may have got yourself into it, but Jesus is able to get yourself out of it. You may not see any way out of it, but Jesus is the way out of it. It's not a court, it's not a doctor, it's not a lawyer, it's not a preacher, it's not a counselor, it's not a psychologist, it's not a psychiatrist. Jesus, the omnipotent God, oh, glory be to God, the God that holds all winds in his fist, the God that stepped out on the bow of the ship and looked at the wind and told it to lay down. Why, that wind recognized it's the voice. It was the voice that created the wind to begin with. Jesus said, peace, be still. I don't think he was telling the wind to be at peace. I think he was telling the disciples that were in that ship, don't worry. There's a song years ago, I think it was in the 70s maybe, was sung, uh, don't worry, be happy. And, uh, hey, I, I, got, I got news for you. Worry never paid a bill. Worry never solved a marriage, never solved a marriage problem. Worry never got you out of any trouble. You don't need to worry. You need to believe and trust in that God that knows where you're at, and that God that knows how to get you out of where you are at. Then God is omnipresent. God, that means God's there. Well, I'm waiting for the Lord to show up. Well, He's there. God's right there. Job said, I looked on my right hand, I couldn't see him. I looked on my left hand, I couldn't see him. I looked in front of me, I looked behind me. He was nowhere to be seen. Ah, but you know what Job said? Job said, he knows the way that I take. Ah, he, he, he knows what I'm going through. He knows where I'm at. And even though I don't see him, I don't feel him, I don't hear him, I know he's here because his word says that he is. And when he gets, when this, when I get through with this trial, this trial's not going to do me in. This trial's not going to destroy me. This trial is not going to finish me. This trial is not going to do away with me. When I get through with this trial, when I go through this, I'm going to be better than it was when I went in. Well, praise the Lord. Uh, uh, we put a, I put a pan of, Made some cornbread today. He made some jalapeno cornbread, and, and I, I, I put some, I put some, I put some uh, self-rising cornmeal in there. And and uh, uh, boy, I, I wasn't even tempted to eat any of it. I mean, it didn't look appealing. 
I put some eggs in there. I, I, you folks that hate buttermilk, I put some buttermilk in there. I put some butter in there. I put some oil in there. I put some, I put some uh, uh, jalapenos in there. I stirred it up. I stirred it. I mean, I stir, I've taken all the lumps out of it. I've stirred it up, but I, I've got, but I've got the skillet there, and I, and I, and I've got the. It's hot. I've had it in that oven for about five or or six minutes for 425 degrees, and it's hot. It's real hot. And I pour that mixture in there, and 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 uh, in 30 minutes, that old doughy, runny, lumpy, uh, self-rising cornmeal, them nasty-looking eggs, that stinky buttermilk, that oil and that butter, you know what, it, it come out? It come out a beautiful brown cornbread. It didn't have no sugar in it either, I'm going to tell you. Come out a beautiful brown uh, cornbread. I slap some butter on that with some big law, man. I'm telling you what, I'm ready to go get some more right now. Glory to God. But, but, but if you separate the cornmeal and the eggs and the buttermilk and the butter, it's not appetizing. But it took the cornmeal and it took the butter and it took the eggs and it took the jalapenos in that hot stove to make the cornbread. Now, I'm going to tell you what you're going through right now. You're in the skillet. <laughs> you're in the skillet and you're in there with that buttermilk you don't like and you're in there with that cornmeal that's lumpy and you got them eggs that's runny and them jalapenos that's hot. And it's very unappetizing. It looks like something that make you want to puke. But if you leave it in the oven and you leave it alone, when the cook pulls that out of the oven, Lord have mercy, you're going to have a big pan of delicious jalapeno cornbread. This trouble you're going through right now that looks bad, it looks, the situation looks bad. Everything about it is unappetizing the old runny cornmeal and the old runny eggs and the old buttermilk that stinks and all that. And how could, how could anything good come out of that? Well, you got to put it in the oven. And some of y'all want to have good cornbread, but you don't want to put it in the oven. But God, God wants to make you, God wants to make you like him. God wants to make your character where you're going to be smelling, oh, when it got the, oh, hallelujah to God, when that fragrance filled that kitchen there, that cornbread, whoo, that cornbread of cooking, and it was smelling good, I'm telling you. I mean, I was, I was, I, I had a saliva, and I said, oh, Lord, I can't hardly wait to get, eat, to get that cornbread put on that plate, put that butter, get some onion and some beans, oh, God. Well, hallelujah, I feel like Brother Cox. I'd be just crazy about it, praise the Lord. Amen. But I'm going to tell you, I'm going to tell you, it took the old runny, it took the old runny cornmeal, and it took the buttermilk, and it took the eggs, and it took the heat to make the cornbread. And some of y'all folk, you listen to me. Listen to me, Racine Apostolic Church. Some of you folks, you can't take the eggs out of it. You can't take the cornmeal out of it. You can't take the oil out of it. You can't take that stinky buttermilk out of it if you want that cornbread. It takes all of those ingredients in that pan to make the cornbread. And I'm going to tell you something. God's trying to make a saint out of you. You may not like that trial. You may not like that betrayal. You may not like somebody talking about you. You may not like that gossip, but you're down there praying. You're down there praying, and you said, Oh, Lord, make me like you, Lord. Make me like you. And the Lord said, Okay, I'll let so-and-so lie on you. Okay, I'll let so-and-so betray you. Okay, I'll let so-and-so forsake you. And you're down there saying, God, I'm trying to live for you. Why is this happening to me? It's because you was praying, asking to be like the Lord. And the Lord has to have all those ingredients in there to make you what he wants you to be. Now, somebody said, what's that got to do with this subject you're talking about? 
God takes your choices, the good ones and the bad ones, and he has those safety nets. He said, you know what? Let me read you this. Let me read you this. I know we quote it, but we don't believe it. Let me read it to you. And we know. We know. Now, I, I, there have been times I didn't know when it was happening. We know that all things work together. It didn't say all things were good. It said all things work together for good. To them that love God and who are thee called according to God's purposes. So God, so God, God through his omniscience, through God's foreknowledge, God said, Well, Adam, Adam's gonna make a Adam's gonna make a bad decision here. He could stop Adam from making it. God's God, he has all power. He 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 could have made the banker say no. He could have made the contractor say no. He could have made whatever say no, but no, 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 no. Adam's got to learn through his choices. If, if God makes all the choices for Adam and God makes all the decisions for Adam, then Adam, Adam will never be what God wants him to be because God not only wants Adam's good choices to glorify him and, God, and Adam's good decisions to glorify him, but God wants Adam to make some bad choices. He's not going to make Adam make any bad choices, but he's made him subject to vanity so that he's given him room. He's given him room where Adam would say, whew, I flubbed on that one. That's why we have altars in our church. We have altars in our church because when God gives you the Holy Ghost, you're not perfect. When God gives you the Holy Ghost, your life's not going to be perfect. And God's not going to the Holy Ghost in you. If you was to follow the Holy Ghost every moment of your day, you would never sin. You would never sin. If you followed the Holy Ghost every second of the day, you would never sin. But you have this treasure, but it's in an earthen vessel. That, 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 that creature that is made subject to vanity, not willingly. I don't want to, Brother Adam, I've never wanted to fail. Every time I have failed, I was embarrassed and ashamed. And why did I do that? But you know what? My failure. Hear me, hear me, church. My failures and my disappointments have made me the person that I am just like my good choices have. If I had went through this life and didn't make a bunch of bad decisions, I, I wouldn't know how to trust God. Anybody can say, oh, I trust the Lord. Yeah, your bank's full of money. And, and your car's running good and your wife ain't acting up and your kids is all good and the sun is shining. I know we sang that song here, the sun is shining and the sky's always bright. I don't know what planet they live on, praise the Lord. But I'm going to tell you what, there's going to be some rainy days. There's going to be some storms in your life. You're going to have some of your dons that's going to be in your life. Then it looks like the ship's not even going to stay together. But God's going to use your, your rockadon to let you know it don't have to be smooth sailing for God to take care of you. God can take care of you in the middle of your rockadon. Well, praise God. God lets the rockadons of our life come by. Because we say, where is God? God said, I'm here right here. I'm right here. Oh, man, I, I wish I'd... I wish every decision that I would have made would have been a good one, I guess. But if I would, how could I have helped anybody? I'm going to confess this, boy. You watch folks be turning that knob up on that. Nobody has a knob anymore, but if they had a knob, they'd be turning that knob up on that phone. I'm going to make a confession. I've sinned since in the church that I've been. 
Am I proud of my sin? No, no, I'm not proud. Am I ashamed of my sin? Yes, yes. I'm, I'm ashamed of my sin. But because I did sin, I experienced God's mercy. Because I did sin, I know that God wouldn't throw me away if I, if I failed and made a mistake. If you're a young person, hear me. If you're a young person, a young married couple, an old senior saint, you're going through some struggles in your life and you're saying, you know, <laughs> I thought I had the Holy Ghost. You, you, you got the Holy Ghost. But you're a creature that's made subject to vanity. Listen to what, listen, listen to what Paul said. 7 and 18 of, of Romans. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For the will to do is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. For the good that I would I do not, and the evil which I would not that I do. Did I, I find in a law that I would do good, but evil is present with me. It's, it's dwelling in me. It's, I, I'm made subject to vanity. I'm, I'm, Creature vanity. Because I'm, now does that give me an excuse to sin? Oh, no, no, no. Folks don't need any excuse to sin. They'll sin without any excuses. I promise you. But what this does teach me, it learns me that in this, in this process of God, if, of, of, God's got some hope. Listen. By the reason of him who subjected the same in hope. There's going to be a hope. And the hope that God has got is when I get through all of this process, when I get through this process, I'm going to be like him. When I get through this process, I'm, I'm not only going to have the, the appreciation that God kept me from sin, that God kept me from evil, that God delivered me from evil, but when I did fall, and when I did fail, when I was ashamed that, oh, he was there, he was there to lift me up and to help me and, and those, 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 those imperfections. I, I, I heard a story years ago about, uh, I think it was Michelangelo, and he made a, a, uh, uh, a sculpture. I can't remember whether it was a sculptor of Moses or David. I'm sorry. I wasn't planning on using this, so I didn't look it up. It's one of the two. He made a sculptor of, of Moses or David, one of the two. And it looked so much like what he thought in his head Moses or David looked like. I mean, he was, when he got through, he was looking at what he had made. And he's. He was so overwhelmed with emotion that he took his instrument and hit its knee and said, speak to me. Because what he made reflected so much of what he was looking for or thought it would be that he hit the knee and really that hit of that knee is really what made it the masterpiece. He was so shocked that it looked so much like what he had planned that he struck it and said, speak, it looked real. Maybe that's what you're going through. Have you thought about that? Maybe that's what you're going through in your experience right now. Maybe he's looking at you and, well, man, I've seen him sail through this temptation. I've seen him sail through this struggle. I've seen him sail through this battle. So he sends this trial. He said, speak. And the sculpture becomes a masterpiece because it really reflected what he planned in his mind. One of these days, one of you hear me, one of these days, by and by when the morning comes, when all the saints of God are gathered home. God is going to make up this glorious, 
body that he's going to call his bride. And with all of their imperfections and all of their failures and faults and whatever, let me, let me read this to you, all of this to you. Back to verse 20. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who subjected the same in hope. Because the creature itself shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groaneth, that's what's going on right now, and travaileth in pain and denial. Got to have pain to have a baby. Got to have pain to have a baby. This world, this world is in such a turmoil hurricanes, earthquakes, COVID, whatever it is, it's, it's, it's getting ready to, to deliver. What's it getting ready to deliver? For not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruit of the Spirit, because we're part of this world. We are self-grown within ourselves, waiting for the adoption even to wit the redemption of the body. Oh, this world's getting ready to be changed forever. For we are saved by hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why does he yet hope for it? But if we hope for that that we see not, then we do with patience wait for it. I'm telling you, there's getting ready to be a better day. And he goes on down here, verse 28, we know all things work together. Verse 29, for whom he did foreknow, that's where God knows, God's got this plan. He also did predestinate, that's the church, not individuals, but the church, to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Listen, moreover, whom he did predestinate, he called, and then that he called, he also justified. And whom he justified, he also glorified. Listen, saint of God, what shall we say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? Whole lot of folks, whole lot of folks, but they don't count. They may be against us, but they can't stop us. He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay any charge to God's elect? It is God that justifies. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, that is risen. Who is even at the right hand of God, also making intercession for us? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? And it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. That's putting them ingredients in the oven. You got to mix the ingredients up and you got to put them in the oven if they're going to come out. But listen, nay, in all these things, Whatever you're going through right now, we're more than conquerors through him that loved us. Listen, for I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, or anything that's going to come up down the road, nor height, nor depth, or any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. So I come to tell you, you might be that creature that was made subject to vanity because God has some hope. God's got some hope that he's working on. And the hope that God's working on, he's going to have some children. He's going to have a bride that's going to be in eternity that's going to live forever with him. But he's got to put them in the oven. He's got to mix them up in the bowl. He's got to put them all together. He's got to beat the lumps out. He's got to put the heat to it.
But if you stay in the oven long enough, glory to God, if you stay in that oven long enough, after a while you look in there and that gooey, yucky looking stuff will turn beautifully brown and have a beautiful aroma and it'll be ready for the table. So hey, don't jump out of the skillet. Don't throw the egg out. Don't throw the butter out. Don't cancel the buttermilk. Put it all in there. Put all the, oh, Lord, all the ingredients, the yucky. Put all them ingredients in there that needs to be. And, Lord, I don't like that, that heat. I don't like that fire. But you can't, you can't cook it in the refrigerator. You can't cook cornbread in the refrigerator. And you can't cook it on the counter. You only got to cook it in the stove. So if you're feeling the heat, if you're going through some heated trials and some heated tests and some heated tribulations and some heated disappointments, hey, I see the timer. We set the timer on, it said between 25 to 30 minutes. We set the timer. We, we looked down there at 25 minutes, Brother uh, Adam. We almost took it out, but it wasn't brown enough. We like a little good crust on there, so we left it in there another five minutes, and then crust come on top of it. Woo, it looked, it, it looked good. So, hey, don't jump out of the fire. Stay in that fire. Hey, hey, he he going to bring you to the table. Boy, when you bring it to the table, everybody said, ooh, ah, they're, woo, don't that look good? Don't that smell good? Don't that taste good? That's where God's got you right now, friend. When God gets through with you, you're going to say, boy, that smells good. They look good. You know, I didn't know they was going to make it. It looked like, they looked awful, awful lumpy. They look awful sour. They look awful, they didn't look like they had it together. The heat, hear me, the heat was what brought all the ingredients together to make the cornbread. And the heat that you're going through right now is bringing all those ingredients, that that creature that was made subject to vanity, God's going to take all of your, all your failures and all your discouragements and all your battles and all your struggles and all your victories and all your shouting and all your crying and all your days and all your nights and all your winters and all your summers and your springs and your falls. God's going to put all that together. And 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 in in that in that in that. Job said, I know when I come, <laughs> I know when I come out of this furnace. You know what? I know. I know. He knows the way that I take. I don't know where I'm going. I don't know what I'm a good doing. I don't know the end game. But he knows the way that I take. But I do know this one thing. When he gets through, when he gets through with me, when he gets through with you, saint of God, you're coming out gold. That old pottery that looks like junk. That uh, you let that pottery stay in that furnace long enough, it'll wind up being a beautiful vase on the shelf. It may look like a piece of old lumpy piece of clay and, and junky looking and, and, and no color to it. It don't look good. But you let that potter mold that. But even after it gets through molded, it's not going to look like much. He takes that clay that he's molded and he puts it in the furnace. And, that, and the furnace is what brings out the beauty that is in that clay. And the furnace you're going through right, hear me, don't be crying about the furnace. Don't be complaining about the heat. Don't be complaining about your struggles. The struggle you're going through right now it's what's going to make you be, be the beautiful piece that God wants you to be. God, in the name of Jesus, as I've done this meandering today, Lord, I, you know, you made us like we are, God. You made us, gave us freedom, a choice. Lord, why all the bad choices that I've made, you was there to rescue me. And the good choices that I've made, you helped me with. 
Now, Lord, I've talked to some saints today that they've got all the ingredients. All the ingredients are there, Lord, but they're in the fire and they're in the heat and it's not pleasant and it's not fun to be in the heat that they're in. But, Lord, you want to make them the vessel you want them to be. And it's only going to be the heat that's going to bring out the beauty. God, I pray that they'll stay submitted to you, Lord, and say, Lord, not my will, but thine be done. Lord, where you'll make them the peace that they need to be for your beautiful collection. In Jesus' name we pray.